Welcome everyone. My name is Kunal Shah and this is The Curious Show, a show all about being curious about our world and learning through discussions with my guests from around the world. Now, my guest today is Virginia Pastrel. She's an author, columnist and speaker whose work spans a broad range of topics from social science to fashion, concentrating on the intersection of culture, commerce and technology. She's a visiting fellow at the Smith Institute for political economy and philosophy at Chapman University, where she teaches classes combining the humanities and economics. And there's lots more on our website. I encourage the viewers, but I'll keep the bio brief so I can listen to more, <laughs> listen uh, to her more. And today we are talking about her book, The Fabric of Civilization, and I'm really excited to talk to her. So welcome to the show, Virginia. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. So if I may begin with you know, the one of the main arguments, I think, in your book, which was that anyone uh, seeking to understand the history of civilization, of commerce, of technology, would be uh, ignoring the uh, crucial role of textile at their own peril. And so this connection between textile and the history of civilization is an unlikely connection, is not apparent at first glance. And so, and also then if we start with the first chapter of fiber and, uh, you know, I think one example that you present which captures this idea well is the disruption in silk production in the early 19th century in Italy. And, and where, uh, which led to the discovery of microbes and the germ theory yeah. of disease vaccines, which saved millions of lives. So again, this connection between textile and vaccines a very uh, not in, not so intuitive at first glance. So could you please start with, uh, you know, a general background on your book yeah, yeah. And, and some thoughts on the first chapter and the life of Augustino Bassi that you present? Yeah, yeah, right. So yes, you're absolutely right that people, when they think about the history of civilization, when they think about the history of you know, economics, trade, when they think about technology. Nowadays, they don't tend to think about textiles. And yet, no matter where you look, textiles tend to be really central. Right. Um, and so if you go back to the earliest uh, long distance trade, certainly the earliest we have written records for, it goes back 4,000 years. It, what are they trading? They're trading textiles. Right. Uh, if, if you look at early machinery or early chemistry, you know, you find textiles. So to, to look at the example that um, you give, silk in the 19th, okay, first of all, we, a lot of us don't think about silk coming from animals. Uh, you know, we think about wool comes from sheep, but in fact, silkworms are animals, they're insects. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way silk is, you, most silk is produced is by care, very carefully raising these silkworms mm -hmm. uh, up to the point that they spin their cocoons mm -hmm. and then killing off the of insects before they can emerge as moths and then unwinding the, the strand it's one single filament off of the cocoon and uh, then combining it with others to make thread so that's just mm -hmm. the quick quick explanation um, there are other forms of silk uh, that people who are you know the vegans or whatever might use uh, for Jane's uh, for um, religious reasons where they allow the uh, the the a moth to emerge but the t the t most silk is this thing where it's not wild it's very cultivated the silkworms can't even survive in the wild anymore mm. so what happened there was this very interesting italian guy he was a lawyer by profession his uh, he came from a family of farmers um you know upwardly mobile but not uh, an elite kind of person mm. and what he really loved was science so he made his living as a lawyer but he he did all kinds of experiments and one of the things that he got interested in uh was a disease that was killing off italy's silkworms and silk was a major major important industry in this in this period and actually going back centuries before in Italy. Um, and what would happen is the, 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 
the caterpillars, the, the silkworms, they would get stiff and they would die and there would be this kind of white powder on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the white powder, uh, they called it calcino, which is like the word for calcium. You know, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Augustino Bassi got interested in, okay, we'll figure out what's causing this. And everybody, including him, thought it was some sort of toxic in the environment. Right. And he tried, you know, he did all kinds of experiments. He subjected these poor silkworms to every kind of toxin he could imagine, and he couldn't get the same result. And right. finally, he was so depressed. I mean, he'd been doing it for years. He used up all his money. His eyesight was failing. He was so depressed. They quit. Um, but he only quit for a year because he, he decided he rallied and he said, I'm going to do this regardless. And eventually he finally noticed that you could have silkworms that were being raised in the exact same condition. They were from the same, you know, they were the same age, et cetera. But if they were in different rooms, mm -hmm. you could get different results. And from this insight, he, eventually realized that what there was was there was a fungus mm. and it was releasing spores and the, they and it would infect the living worms and then once they it completely took them over they would die and then that's when they became contagious was when they died and they got this powder and this was the very first time this is around early 1900s um might have been a, i gotta check that <laughs> yeah yeah early 1800s i'm sorry early 19th century yeah early uh, yeah. Century. Er, yeah right early uh, 1800s this right. was the very first time that someone figured out right. that a microorganism could cause a disease in animals oh. um and then about a gener and and he wrote it all up and but he was a nobody. I mean, he, as I say, he was a lawyer, so he was maybe prominent in this town. But right. he, you know, he didn't have government <laughs> support. He wasn't at a big university, right. uh, he, uh, anything like that. But he did write a book. He wrote it all down. So then about a generation later, there's another silkworm disease that is devastating all the silkworms in Europe uh, and particularly in France. And there Louis Pasteur, who you know is much more famous, uh, right. gave us pasteurization, developed early vaccines. Uh, he worked on that silkworm disease, which was called Pebrine. Okay. And he and he's the one who I mean, when I first started looking at the connection between silkworms and microbiology, I was looking at Pasteur because uh, that's what's known. Right. Um, and and that was the first time he worked on an animal. Mm. Uh, so uh, he had been previously he had studied problems in beer making or wine or anyway, something it was yeast, but it was an alcohol. Right. Um, uh, but this, the government asked him, could he, you know, you're a famous scientist, could you work on this? And he had Bossy's book, which helped him a lot. Right. Uh, and he, he, he didn't find a cure for it, but he found ways of finding which eggs would be less likely to, uh, develop it. But the point is that because silkworms were such, they were really valuable. And they right. were animals, uh, and there was an industry devoted to them, that this is the first place that people started to do these experiments to find out the connections between microorganisms and disease. And, and Bossy also was the first person who developed ideas of disinfection. So, mm -hmm. you know, all the workers who would be working with the silkworms, they would have to use various disinfection, uh, disinfectants on their hands and on any kind of trays or anything that they use to kill this off. And then of course that leads to applying that in hospitals and other kinds mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, healthcare environments later. So then if I could get to the second chapter from, from fiber to thread, and in right. this chapter, one uh, idea that I found interesting was uh, that you mentioned, which is that the lives of uh, pre-industrial era women 
and how they spend their days and their lives uh, with the activity of spinning. Spinning, spinning. Yeah. Women before the Industrial Revolution all over the world yeah, 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 all over were the world. spinning. And you see mm-hmm. it in art, you know, representation, particularly in European art, but uh, but also uh, elsewhere. Uh, yeah. You know, the Im- in the image of the woman is often she's spinning or she has the fibers that she would be spinning. Uh, And also, if you want to represent the different types of economic activities, you would have agriculture and they show a guy, you know, digging the farmer Uh, and you would have industry and you show somebody counting money and keeping his books. And then you would, I mean, that was, I'm sorry, commerce. You show somebody counting money and keeping his books. And then uh, industry was a woman spinning because that was the central manufacturing activity. And the reason is you, the reason women spend all their time spinning is that it takes a lot of thread to make anything. So if you take um, a, a typical pair of trousers, I used blue jeans as my example, uh, the the amount of thread in, in the cloth to make a pair of blue jeans is about six miles or 10 kilometers of thread. I mean, that's a lot of thread. And before the industrial revolution, the fastest and best spinners in the world, particularly for uh, cotton, were Indian women using the charka. And so they could spend that much thread in about 100 hours. But that's mm. one pair of trousers, and those are the fastest spinners. Right. And so if you think about it, and of course, it's not just clothes, it's it's sails, it's tents, I... it's bag, you know, sacks for shipping things, it's I... belts of various sorts, home furnishings, all of these kinds of things. And so you start to see why text, the invention of spinning machines, mm. what you know, that launched the Industrial Revolution, which obviously went on to include other things, but that changes, that ripples throughout the economy uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And when once you have thread being abundant. So I think uh, you also see that more than the fact that it was a reflection of, say, societal uh, imposition of gender roles, or maybe it was an... Uh, women, you know, being independent and autonomous, but more also important is to uh, consider the fact that it was an essential role in society. Right, right. It was, it was very essential and it was recognized as essential. Now you often will see uh, feminist historians today who point out that these women were very low paid, which they were, they were very low paid. And they will say, well, that's because there were women, that's because of, you know, patriarchy, et cetera. That's not the reason for the low wages. The reason for the low wages is that it takes so long to make anything that you could use. So you can't pay more because otherwise nobody could afford cloth. Now, where the woman part fits in is that women didn't necessarily have a, you know, they couldn't necessarily get a better job. They couldn't, for example, uh, in many places, uh, weavers would make more than spinners, uh, but women couldn't be weavers. But yes, it it was recognized as a really important role, and and you know, so so women's manufacturing activity. That's why you see pictures of it in art, uh, mm. because it it was something that people were doing all the time, and it was absolutely essential. But it was very low paid because it was very low productivity. So speaking of weaving, so from fiber to thread to cloth, uh, one one of the ideas that was, again, really fascinating was connecting weaving with math. And I like your anecdote about uh, at the dinner when you talk to two viewers and you were saying (laughs) what weaving is about, they both say almost in unison, it's all about math. Yeah, yeah. uh, Yeah. Some thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's a quote I like from an anthropologist which who said cloth is the evidence of mathematics in the tangible world and the way I like to put it is cloth is embodied code because mathematics is a science of patterns Mm. and uh you you if you look 
you know, going back in history, people are using uh, either explicitly or implicitly using mathematical concepts and mathematical uh, relations in order to create their cloth. So for example, uh, if you want to make stripes on a cloth or you want to create a, uh, a regular pattern across a cloth, you need to know about ratios of numbers. You need to uh, think about prime numbers. You need to figure right. out what's divisible by what. And I write in the book about uh, a historian uh, who has looked at the idea that some of the original Greek concepts about what we would call today number theory, which is like the relationship between numbers, what's prime, what what's divisible by what, that all that came out of weaving and weaving was very, very central activity in ancient Greece. Um, so that that's one thing, but ideas of symmetry, uh, all of these things are very important in weaving. And of course, it's the original binary activity. Right, it's, you right. know, the thread is either up or it's down. It's you're going over or under ones and zeros. They're just intrinsic in that quality. And so a lot of people, the one thing they know about textile history today, if you go, is they'll say, did you know looms were the first computers? And that's not really exactly true. <laughs> But this is a reference to Jean-Marie uh, Jacquard's attachment that he developed as a way of making complex, automating, making complex patterns. And it would use, it used punch cards to tell the loom which threads to lift or, or leave down. Um, mm. And that did inspire some early thinking about computing. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, before I get to my last two questions, I, I do have a fun uh, uh, short story segment in between, which is, uh, and for today, it's just a fun game. Where I'm going to give you three choices and <laughs> you, you have to pick one. All right. Okay. So first set of choices is uh, between cotton, <laughs> linen and silk, if you had to pick one, why? And the second set of choices, uh, you know, uh, spinning, weaving and knitting, if you had to pick one, why? And again, this is you know, yeah, you can take no, it in, it's in, easy. In, it's in, easy. In so direction. okay, okay. So definitely not linen on the first one because linen, oh, no. even it, it's either very scratchy or it wrinkles as soon as you look at it. So I'm not a. Oh, I mean, I like it better than wool, but I don't like. I, I mean, if I have a choice, I guess I would pick silk because it's okay. you know softer, it's more lustrous, it's harder to take care of. So oh, cotton right. has a lot of advantages there. Oh, um, right. And then definitely weaving. Um, oh. I have done all three uh, in in doing my book. I I I took. I'm not a very good spinner. I'll never be a spinner. <laughs> you know, once you people get good at it, they can do it unconsciously. But I'm not very good at. it. I don't like it. And then I tried. I had done some knitting when I was a teenager, a little bit. I never was very good at it. But I took it up again, thinking, "Oh, I'll learn about knitting because knitting is another form of code. It's just not as old as weaving." Right. Um, but I have arthritis, and so it does. It's not good. So weaving, right, right. and I love weaving. I mean, I, it's 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 fascinating the patterns you can make, the possibilities, the the colors, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. All right. So so I'm gonna skip to the last two chapters. I'm gonna you know hope the viewers yeah. uh, will be interested in reading more about the other chapters. So uh, the sixth chapter on consumers. I, I like the two examples where you mentioned about the French prohibition on the cotton yeah. prints, as well as yeah. the. Uh, evolving taste of uh, you know Maya women in Guatemala, and yeah. which which kind of uh, shows how consumer tastes kind of go beyond governmental laws and cultural norms. So could yeah. you uh, talk about that chapter? Yeah. So so the theme of this chapter on consumers is all of this effort, which you know, and there's a chapter on dyes, which I love, and a lot of people right, like right. the chapter on dyes more, and and trading and all these things. But it's all because people want cloth. They want and they want what they want, and sometimes they go to extreme lengths to get it. Uh, either uh, you know, sometimes it's brutal, sometimes dodging the law, etc. And uh, the the example about uh, the prohibition is when Indian cotton prints uh, became 
popular in Europe in the 17th century. They they came into Europe before that, but they they really the big thing. So these everybody loved them because first of all, Europeans didn't historically have prints. And these were very, you could launder them. The colors, they had really color fast uh, dyes and, you know, and it was cotton and cotton was known in Europe, but it wasn't common. And, you know, it's a wonderful uh, fabric. So they, they hit Europe and it was a, a revolution. It's been called the, the cloth that changed the world. And, and there's a lot of truth in that. Well, they threatened the status quo. Uh, and in some places, particularly the Netherlands, this, the government said, tough, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're going to have competition. We're just going to have competition. Um, uh, in other places, they were taxed. And, and France had the most extreme uh, policy. For 73 years, France made it a crime to own or sell. Mm not only the cotton prints from India, which were called calicos or Indians, right. but, but any cotton fabric, even if it was made in France, and any print, even if it was made in France on French cloth. So it was extreme because the silk industry was so big there. And, and the thing about these prints is they were great. One reason they were so popular is you could get them at every price point. You could get the equivalent of like a little bandana kerchief if you were just a worker, but they were also very lux. There were very luxurious versions and the, the Indian producers adapted them to European taste just as before this period they had exported to places like Malaysia and they had mm -hmm. adapted to that taste. Right. So they were used to, you know, serving the market. Right. Well, anyway, so, and the French didn't obey the law basically for 73 years, it was like cocaine in the United States today. I mean, people didn't obey the law uh, and they kept making the penalties greater and the people still didn't obey the law. And eventually they got, you know, it took 73 years, but eventually they got rid of it. And I have a video on my YouTube channel about this because right. it's one of the great, yeah, the great stories in the book. Now the Guatemalan uh, story is very different because it's not really about the government. Um, Guatemalan women, these are the indigenous women, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the descendants of the indigenous people, they wear a traditional outfit that's called a traje in Spanish. Um, and it, it is a skirt that is a long length of cloth, um, uh, usually cotton, although, you know, now uh, that is woven on a, a, a European style hand loom. So this is something that came after the Spanish, uh, uh, you know, conquest uh, that right. these in, this new technology of the European handlooms was introduced, and it's still woven on a handloom now. Uh, so they wear this skirt, which is wrapped around the body, and it's secured with a tight belt, which is woven right. on a back strap loom. And then they have a blouse, uh, right. which is woven in pieces and then sewn together on a back strap loom. Okay. And traditionally, every village had a certain it's not like everybody in the village dressed identically, but there were certain patterns that were associated with this village. So, you know, in this village, they have red stripes right. or in this village, they wear blue or, right. and it gets a little more complicated than that. Right. Um, and interestingly, one thing I learned when I was in Guatemala and when Guatemalans go to school, they're taught that the Spanish made them do this. But that's oh, wow. not true at all. And in fact, if you go all over the world in places where villages are isolated, you know, you get similar patterns. Yeah, where, uh, but that's not true anyway, but that's what people <laughs> learn in school. <laughs> so the different villages had these different things. Then going back really about maybe 20 years ago, uh, the 1990s, people started trading uh, from village to village and buying is still the traditional clothing, but they would just, it wasn't necessarily what they had in their village. They would just like this other person's village of uh, style and they would just buy it because they liked it. It was fashion. And uh, a, a, a uh, 
type of dress evolved where they would pick a color and they would have that color in in the blouse the belt and the skirt and sometimes their shoes too and you know mm -hmm. accessories so you really saw this development of fashion and a lot and nowadays when more and more people are you know working in the formal market mm -hmm. um they they still are dressing in a way that is identifiably Maya, that is identifiably characteristic of the indigenous people. Um, but the blouse today will be made in a factory and made of polyester and, and decorated with machine uh, embroidery or machine laces or whatever, but it will still be the same shape. And the but it's cooler and it's easier to take care of and stuff. And they'll still have the tr very traditional ones, but those will be for special occasions. So it's an example of when you have a living textile culture, uh, even if it's very traditional uh, and very in tied to people's sense of their identities and, and their, tra their traditions, it's, it doesn't stay still. It's not right. under glass. It's going to evolve. It's going right. to have a uh, variety uh, over time. And, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. And another thing about it is that you'll see these women and they're very traditionally dressed and they tuck their cell phones in the belt. <laughs> so everything is traditional except that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like a fusion of like modern yeah, and traditional. Yeah, because they are modern. I mean, these are 21st wow. century people, you know, <laughs> they may live in a little village, uh, but but they are, you know, they're, they're, it is not a zoo, it's actual <laughs> people who are living and going about their lives. And, right. and they're just wearing this kind of apparel that comes down uh, from their ancestors, but it's never been identical uh it, right. it's always evolved uh right. there are other you know you go back farther there are, you know introductions of synth synthetic dyes uh in right. the 19th century people changed patterns you know when they started to get books that were designed for embroidery they applied it to their weaving you know they they're creative people and taking right, right, ideas right. from wherever the ideas come from yeah right all right, so that brings me to my last question, and you can uh, weave in the last chapter of innovation here too. But could you uh, provide some closing thoughts on your book, and also what you know, maybe what you see in the future for textiles? Yeah, so I I think the big message of the book is that you can't really understand either human history or mm -hmm. the evolution of technology without understanding textiles. And then conversely, if you read this textile history, you get a great rich understanding mm -hmm. of patterns of trade, of economics, of, of technology, of even geography. <laughs> oh, you know, you start to understand, oh, uh, these places in Italy, they're just over the Alps from Lyon, France, or th this is how the, the, uh, the Uyghurs, uh, you know, today we talk about the problems of the Uyghurs in China, but how, how were they Muslims in the first place? And that some discussion of that in the book so there's a lot it 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 bears a lot of it tells you a lot about you know sort of our world and how we got there mm -hmm. uh what's interesting today is uh when i talked when i was working on the last chapter of the book which is the sort of looking forward i found that there were lots of scientists who didn't start out doing anything to do with textiles uh but they would figure out that their research had some application to textiles, often uh, people concerned with environmental impacts, but all different things. And that would lead them, they would, they realize that textiles, because they're everywhere and it's such a huge industry and it's part, such an everyday part of our lives that if they could apply their research to textiles, it could have a huge impact. So I end with this idea of change textiles, change the world. Well, I mean, it was just a wonderful book. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's been really fun.